I'm going to be talking about industrial control systems, which are at the core of all critical infrastructure around the world. Uh, gas pipelines, water treatment plants, the electric grid. Um, the potential consequences of attacking critical infrastructure, of course, are much different than IT systems. The, uh, the, the ultimate risk here is not the espionage or the theft of data, but uh, the loss of critical services and functions for a prolonged period and potentially maybe even death, depending on the service. So in keeping with the theme of the conference, Retro, I want to take you back to 2007, to the fourth in the series of the Bruce Willis films, Die Hard. This one was a digital version, uh, focusing on terrorists who were conducting a fire sale, which was a multi-pronged attack against uh, different kinds of critical infrastructure. Um, this story was based on, I don't know if you're aware of it, was based on a 1979 book. Uh, the, the general story about terrorists, it wasn't a digital book, but it was based on this, the book from 1979 and also a 1997 Wired story called A Farewell to Arms. The story was about uh, um, war games that were happening in Washington, D.C looking at scenarios for what would happen if attackers targeted uh, critical infrastructure, a lot of different critical infrastructure at the same time in the US while they were conducting kinetic attacks in addition. So kidnapping an ambassador, hijacking planes, dropping bombs on military facilities, um, also then taking out digitally a telecom, let's say in a state, taking out Amtrak signals on the train stations going from New York to DC, uh, air traffic control, a series of things. So that's what they were looking at, at potential. So Hollywood saw this story and decided that this would make a great blockbuster. And that the original working title was www3.com, worldwar3.com. But Hollywood producers quickly realized, of course, that hacking isn't very visual. So instead, we got a lot of this in the film. So nothing driven by digital, but... Um, this movie came out in June 2007, and uh, it turns out that there were actually already in the works development uh, of attacks that would cause physical destruction using digital means. Uh, how many people know about the Aurora Generator Test? Not that many, okay. So the Aurora Generator Test was in March 2007, three months before the Die Hard movie came out. This was prompted by some researchers at Idaho National Lab who were asking the question, would it be possible to cause physical destruction using nothing more than malicious code? So would it be possible to have code leap from the digital realm to the physical realm, not just cause some kind of effect on the computers that they were infecting, but cause physical destruction of the equipment that was being controlled by computers? And what they decided to do was target their attack on something called a protective relay. Protective relay is a safety mechanism on the grid. It's designed to detect when systems are getting into an unsafe condition. So the grid in the US, everything operates at 60 hertz, the grid and all equipment that connects to it, such as a generator. And the protective relay is designed to detect if that equipment is getting out of sync or out of phase with the grid. And if that occurs, then the protective relay instructs the breakers to open up and disconnect that equipment from the grid. So disconnect the, the generator so that neither the grid uh, suffers any danger and neither uh, nor does the generator. So what they did was they, this is a safety mechanism, so they decided to target their attack on that safety mechanism and actually turn the safety system into the attack vector. They wrote just 21 lines of code. This was a 25-ton generator that was retired from the oil fields in Alaska. They trucked it out to Idaho, uh, hooked it up to the grid. The 21 lines of code were designed to tell the, safe, to tell the safety system that an unsafe condition was actually a safe condition. So when the generator gets into an unsafe condition, the protective relay should pr prohibit it from joining it back to the grid. The malicious code told the protective relay that that's actually a safe condition. So they designed a cyclical attack. They told the protective relay to open the breaker, close the breaker, open the breaker, close the breaker. And what happens when you open the breaker and you disconnect that generator from the grid, the generator is going to speed up and start operating at a higher frequency. At that point, of course, the protective relay should pre prevent it from joining the, the grid again. But the code said this is okay. So they opened the breakers, closed the breaker, opened the breaker, closed the breaker. Each time the breaker opens, the generator starts producing more energy than the grid can withstand. 
when the breaker closes again, that excess energy from the generator hits the slower grid, bounces back against the generator, and does this. Can you turn up the sound a little? That attack took three minutes, but only because the engineers built in some pauses into the attack so that the safety engineers could check everything as it was going. They could have done it in just 15 seconds. Um, this was a proof of concept. We know already that Stuxnet had already been created at this point and was being prepared to be unleashed at Iran. I'm not going to talk a lot about Stuxnet. I wrote a book. You can actually go go there if you want for all of the details, but I do want to just talk in sort of general terms about it because it, it opened our eyes to the dangers of critical infrastructure and the security problems with them. So uh, Stuxnet was unleashed. To, there were two versions that were discovered. The first one was unleashed in 2007. The second version that was discovered was unleashed in 2009. It was re-released again in 2010. Uh, what Stuxnet did was it was looking for industrial control systems made by the German company Siemens. So Stuxnet was a worm. It would travel to Windows systems and infect Windows systems, but it would only unleash its payload if it found a very, very specific configuration of industrial control systems at the facility that it was infecting. So once it got onto a system, it was searching for the presence of Siemens industrial control system software called WinCC, which is used to program a component called a programmable logic controller, a PLC. It was also looking for software called Step 7, and that is used to monitor the processes that are controlled by a PLC. And then it was looking for two specific models of Siemens PLC, the S7315 PLC and the S7417 PLC. And what Stuxnet did when it got onto those systems would target the components that were being controlled by those, those two PLCs. The S7417 is a high-end Siemens PLC. It costs about $10,000, and it was controlling the exit valves on centrifuges. So what happened was the way that the enrichment process works is uranium hexafluoride gas is pumped into the centrifuge at right here through pipes at the top of it. And then there's a rotor inside that spins at supersonic speed, separating the isotopes that are needed for nuclear fission from the isotopes that aren't needed. And that enriched uranium with the isotopes that are needed are then scraped out one of those other pipes and sent into another batch of centrifuges to be further enriched. So in this case, Stuxnet closed the exit valves so that gas could get in, but it couldn't get out. The other attack was targeting the S7315, and that was controlling frequency converters, which were controlling the, uh, the electricity going to spinning the centrifuges. So what happened in these two separate attacks? The first attack was actually the one that targeted the 417. This was one unleashed in 2007. Like I said, it controlled the exit valves. When Stuxnet got on the PLC, it didn't initially begin the sabotage. It actually recorded normal operations of the PLC and the centrifuges that they were controlling, and it stored that data until it needed it. Then at the end of 30 days, the attack, uh, the sabotage begins, and Stuxnet starts closing the exit valves. Like I said, the gas is going in, but it's not getting out. And what happens when that gas goes into the centrifuge and it can't get out is the pressure inside the centrifuge starts to increase. And so they wait for about two hours or until the pressure is increased about five times what is normal. And during that period, it takes the, um, the data that it recorded during that initial 30 days showing the normal operations of the plant. It feeds that data now to the monitor to the monitors. So the operators are looking at their screens. They see pressure is OK. All the, all the valves are open. They don't see anything wrong. And it also disables the safety system. Uh, like the protective relay on the grid, the centrifuges had a safety system that was supposed to detect if it got out into a set unsafe condition, and then it would shut down the centrifuges. So it, it disabled that so it couldn't stop. And then at the end of the sabotage, at the end of those two hours, rinse and repeat. It goes back to 30 days, recording normal operations, and then another round of sabotage. And what that tells us is that the attackers were not after one-time catastrophic damage, but they were looking to do incremental damage over its time that would be hard to detect and hard to point. 
the Iranian engineers would see that they're having problems with the enrichment process, but they wouldn't be able to figure out what was going on or anticipate what might happen next. The other attack, this one was launched in 2009 in June and then again in March 2010. Like I said, it targeted a different PLC which was controlling the frequency converters. This one had a similar uh, plan. It would sit on the system, wouldn't initially do the sabotage, record normal operations, and then this time when the sabotage began, instead of closing exit valves, it increased the frequency of the centrifuges for only about 15 minutes, but that, that frequency was about the maximum that these particular centrifuges could withstand because they weren't really built very well. They're first-generation centrifuges. And then at the second stage, uh, Stuxnet would uh, reduce the frequency uh, for, uh, uh, sorry, it would reduce the frequency to normal and then waited 26 days and during the next round of the attack would reduce it to two hertz for about 50 minutes. And I'll go into uh, what that effect would have, but during that period, they did the same thing. They fed that false data, they disabled the safety system, and again, rinse and repeat, cyclical. So what are the consequences? When that gas is going into the centrifuge and it can't get out and the pressure is increasing, that gas starts to solidify. And so it starts to get caught on that rotor inside the centrifuge and you're gonna start to damage the, the rotors and the centrifuge that might scrape against the inside of the, the centrifuge. Iran had a limited supply of uranium hexafluoride gas that it purchased illicitly from China and they had a limited supply of materials with which to build new centrifuges. The aim here was to buy time for diplomacy to work, to retard the enrichment process, slow it down until they could bring the Iranians to the table and get some kind of agreement with them. So these, these two attacks would both waste the gas that Iran had and uh, waste the uh, centrifuge material. And this is sort of the sabotage at a glance. You can see the pink lines. The number of centrifuges being stalled is growing. The amount of enriched uranium is not. And uh, the other pro the, uh, that I didn't mention, when you, s when you speed up and slow down the centrifuge and speed up and slow down, you're actually sabotaging the enrichment process itself because the enrichment needs the centrifuges to be spinning at a uniform speed for a long period of time. And when you speed up and slow down and speed up and slow down, those the isotopes that have been separated start to come back together. And so the Iranians at the end of that process were expecting to get uranium enriched to a certain level and what they were actually getting was something enriched at this level. So I talk about that because it, it, it created all kinds of implications for the security of the wider family of industrial control systems that were being used. The IT world, the security world, wasn't paying attention to industrial control systems until Stuxnet. There was a very small minority of people who specialized in this area. Vendors weren't creating secure systems. And once this uh, Stuxnet put industrial control systems on the map, in particular PLCs and other components, then people started looking at these systems and they found that they were never designed with security in mind. Uh, no authentication, no encryption, uh, vulnerabilities and protocols. The systems were promiscuous. They would communicate with any device. Um, so a lot of problems that couldn't be patched. They were problems that needed re-architecting. So these are some of the industrial control systems that exist. You probably are all aware of the SCADA system. Um, these are used for jar large geographical areas um, for like gas pipelines, water distribution, uh, distributed control systems, more contained uh, systems, environments, and then some components, the PLCs and RTU remote terminal unit. So I wanna talk in particular about the PLCs uh, because that's what Stuxnet exposed. First PLCs were designed in the 1960s for the automotive industry to try and automate processes. They weren't digital yet. They replaced hardwired relay geologic systems. And then in the 1990s, they started to become digitized and they also started to become uh, connected to the internet via modem for remote access. Um, these were proprietary systems, so no one was really concerned about the security. Actually, no one was even talking about security at that point. But they were proprietary systems, so the real harm would have come from insiders who had that specialized knowledge of these systems. Um, and then uh, what changed, however, was in the late 90s, we had a lot of regulation start to get introduced, especially for the environment in the US. And when you have that regulation, it means that in the past, only engineers needed to have access to that process control data. And so they uh, had access to the proprietary, proprietary systems. But now you needed people in the legal office. You needed the, co the company lawyers. You needed regulators. You needed a lot of other people in the business offices to be able to access that same data. And they needed systems that could actually communicate with those systems. So everything sort of migrated to Windows PCs. And in that migration then, it opened up to a world of vulnerabilities that of course were already inherent in the Windows 
uh, commercial systems. So I said these systems control all critical infrastructure around the world. This is sort of an, a sample of what they are controlling, power plants, water treatment plants, reservoirs and dams, car assembly lines, chemical, pharmaceutical, food and beverage plants. They, they control the temperature at which food is pasteurized. And so you imagine that if someone can actually alter that temperature, uh, you can uh, introduce food into the markets that could potentially cause sickness. Uh, they control elevators, heating and air conditioning in schools and hospitals. They control traffic lights, furnaces and kilns where glass, fiberglass and steel are made. Again, if you can control how the material is made, if you can alter it or undermine it in some way, then you can uh, affect the integrity of that, the material. They also control the routing of commuter and freight trains, keep them from crashing, and they lower and raise drawbridges over waterways. And they also operate cell doors at high security prisons. In 2011, I wrote a story about some researchers who gave a presentation at the DEF CON Hacker Conference. They were invited in by a prison in the US to conduct a pen test to see if they could actually hack the systems that are controlling the prison. And lo and behold, they discovered that there were PLCs on a laptop or a desktop computer that were controlling the, uh, the prison doors. And these were the same desktop systems that the guards were using to read their email, surf the internet. And so, of course, they were able to get there and undermine the system. So that was 2011. In 2013, I came across this story that described uh, how at a high security wing at a prison, suddenly all of the doors sprung open. They called it a computer glitch. Uh, we never got to the bottom of what actually happened here, but I thought the, the conjunction or the, the, it wasn't a coincidence, let's say. I don't think it was a coincidence that the research was uh, published in 2011, and then you had that in 2013. And then in 2015, if any of you watched Mr. Robot, you might remember that he used this attack uh, to, oh, to target the PLCs at a prison in order to spring open all of the prison doors and free a drug addict, uh, Elliot. So here, here we, we see you going through the systems here. He decided to go through a, a laptop in a patrol car. The patrol car visits the prison, communicates uh, through the, to the prison network through that patrol car, drops the exploit on the laptop, gets it into the prison network, and then because all of the stall doors open simultaneously, it causes a power surge, power goes out, doors all open, and everyone is sprung free. So, uh, turns out also that industrial control systems are in weapon systems. This is not something that I knew for a long time. Um, this comes from a report, a government report in the US from 2018, that's a fake weapon that they put together as an illustration. Um, they don't go into a lot of detail about how the industrial control systems are used, but they're generally used to automate systems, control processes, and have other systems communicate in a centralized way. Um, clicker's not working. Can you advance the slide for me? Ronan? Ah, there we go. So this was the GAO report from 2018, and I thought this quote was interesting. DOD officials said that program offices may not know which industrial control systems are embedded in their weapon systems or what the security implications of them are. Now, I'm going to talk a little more about weapon systems later, um, but I'll come back to that. Uh, but I want to move sort of ahead to get into attacks that we've seen on industrial control systems and potential attacks. After Stuxnet was discovered, we assumed that there would be a lot of copycat attacks against critical infrastructure. And surprisingly, there weren't for a while. The first one we saw, we don't have a lot of information about. This was in 2014, a German steel mill. It was a, basically a footnote at the bottom of a German government report, is how we found out about it. They provided very little information. They said that the hackers got access through a spear phishing, uh, not a spear hushing, a spear phishing attack. Um, in the business network, migrated to the control network, manipulated the control systems in such a way that a blast furnace was not able to shut down. It uh, resulted in massive, though unspecified damage. They weren't clear about it. Um, and they said the attackers possessed advanced knowledge of how industrial control systems work. So that's sort of the first sign. Of course, you are all familiar with the, what happened in Ukraine in 2015 and 2016. 2015 one is of particular importance so this was in the, the middle of winter. It happened around five o'clock in the afternoon. Suddenly the electricity goes out. Workers are coming home from work. They're 
turning on the heat at home, they're getting ready to cook dinner, um, and then all the electricity goes out for about 250,000 customers. The attackers came in, again, through a phishing attack in the business network in the spring of 2015. They immediately stole credentials for the workers for the VPN, moved back out of the network, came back in as those employees, and then spent six months conducting reconnaissance and designing attack. When they finally did the attack in December 2015, they, they attacked three distribution plants simultaneously. They, they were, three plants were all using different industrial control systems, so they had to design different attacks for these. What they did was they took out uh, 60 substations, were taken offline, opening the breakers on them. But at the same time that they did that, they also launched a telephony denial of service attack against the customer call center. So customers are being uh, thrown into the dark uh, and they are picking up the phone to call the call center and they can't get through because there's a denial of service. At the same time, uh, well, actually, the, so the workers inside the plants don't know what's going on. They look at their operating sa stations. They see that electricity is flowing. Uh, they don't see any problem. And the first sign of problem was when one of the workers looks at his, uh, sorry, at his monitoring screen and he sees that the cursor starts moving without any volition of his. So he sees it moving, realizes that there's someone inside the network, immediately tries to take control of it. They kick him out, change the password, he can't get in. And then the hackers uh, realize that, they've been, that everyone is aware now. They cut backup power to the control rooms. So as the operators are scrambling to try and figure out what's going on, suddenly they're, they're in some confusion in the dark. They start wiping operator stations so they can't recover. Um, and then when they do try to recover, it turns out that the attackers had overwritten the firmware um, on, at the RTUs at 16 substations. So they couldn't send remote commands to restore, uh, to reclose the breakers and restore power. They had to then drive out uh, physically to the field and manually close those breakers. So this is a video that was taken by one of the operators at one of the plants showing the hackers controlling the cursor. А что ты мне зараз робишь? Чего вы взяли? Это вы на секционный что-то хотите? Что хочешь отключить? А, спро да. спро спроба вымкнуть секционный 110 киловольт. Він у нас не заведений під телемеханіку. Ні, ми, ми тут не маємо. Ні, він не заведений взагалі під телемеханіку, але спроба це зробити є. Це от зараз треба вирубати. Вручана така є штука, але вони там заведено. І що, це другий раз пробує зробити 110? А може це айтішники роблять? So I love how casual and curious they are about all this. And one of them says, we need to call the IT guys. What, wait, what if it is the IT guys? So that was the 2015. The next attack we see uh, goes to the next stage of danger. This was in 2015. Maybe you are, many of you are already aware of the Triton attack. This targeted a petrochemical and refinery in Saudi Arabia. Uh, this time, the attackers, again, they came in from their business network, they make their way to the process network. You're seeing a plan here, you're seeing a, a repeat modus operandi. They compromised six controllers, overwrote the devices. The first hint that something was going on was uh, when they, the system shut down. So what they were targeting here was the safety mechanisms. Um, like Stuxnet did, right? Undermining that, the integrity of that safety system. Here, the safety system is designed to shut down the refinery if it's getting into a, maybe a chemical spill or an unsafe condition. Um, in this case, their code was written badly. It had a flaw and it actually triggered the safety system to operate in exactly the way it should operate. It shut down the plant. Uh, the uh, workers at the plant gave the controller, sent the controller to the manufacturer. They were looking for what kind of problem might have caused it. They couldn't find anything. They opened the plant up again, and then in August it, it happens again. 
Um, and then that's when they take a closer look, they bring in some forensic investigators, and then they do find the malware, and it was eventually traced to that. But when you're going after the safety mechanism on the system, then especially if at a chemical plant, then the potential there is a possibility of an, a major chemical spill that could potentially cause death. So now we're getting into much more serious kinds of attacks. We see that Russia has an interest in this kind of opportunity, um, and so that's where attacks could be going in the future. Um, it's not advancing again. So this was something that was discovered in 2022, um, around the time that the invasion was occurring at, uh, in Ukraine. Um, researchers and government, US government, discovered this modular reversal of toolkit. toolkit. This is now a fully functional, fully featured toolkit that's designed specifically to go after industrial control systems and potentially cause disruption, uh, denial of services, and destruction. Um, there's not a lot of information available about this. They're not being very open about it. They haven't told us where they discovered it, but they've implied that it was never actually deployed, which suggests that maybe uh, someone hacked into the hacker's computers and found the toolkit, or maybe it was on a staging server or something. We don't know. They're not being very clear about it. But again, it means that they're, they're setting the stage for these kinds of attacks. So Colonial Pipeline, right? You don't need actually a sophisticated attack to take down control, uh, to take down control processes. Uh, this one, of course, was a ransomware attack against the IT network. In this case, there was an operator that had a machine on his desktop, which was for the IT network. He had a separate machine on the desktop right next to it for the operational network. He sees the ransomware kick in on the IT network, panics, and shuts down the IoT network because he's afraid that it's going to pass. They, the company insists that these two, two networks were segmented, and, but this guy panics, shuts it down, 5,500 miles of pipeline shut down, uh, oil is not flowing to the East Coast, and then, of course, uh, what happens is that the attackers didn't design this, they never intended this, but the consequence is that the reaction of the public to this is that there's a panic and a run on gas, and then there becomes a gas shortage. There wasn't actually a gas shortage, but there was a run on the gas that created a shortage. And then, uh, same year, the Oldsmar uh, water treatment plant in Florida, uh, hackers got in and raised the level of lye, the chemical for the water, from 100 parts per million to 11,000 parts per million. An alert operator saw it, changed it back, um, but the system had no security at all. They were using an unsupported Windows operating system. The control system was connected to the internet without any uh, real uh, protection, and the operators were all using the same password that had actually been leaked to the internet in a hack. So this is what uh, the control system looks like on the internet. Not very sophisticated, right? 1980s, maybe? So this is Jason Larson. He's a researcher or was a researcher at Idaho National Lab. This was a demonstration that he gave at DEF CON uh, many years ago where he was looking at hacking a barrel at a chemical plant. And the hack was really simple. He designed it to increase the heat inside the barrel at the same time that he was simultaneously decreasing the pressure inside. Should I play that again? Anyone who didn't see it? Watch the barrel behind him. So, uh, like I said, we, ha we don't have a lot of examples of these kinds of attacks going on, but we see the preparation, we see a lot of interest in these kinds of attacks. But hackers study accidents that happen in the industrial sector in order to see the consequences, to see the vulnerabilities, and then potentially design attacks that would have the same consequences. So I want to talk for a bit about uh, some accidents that have occurred uh, in the U.S. in particular, uh, because they have an industrial control system element to them, but they weren't caused by hackers. So this occurred in 2010 in my state in California, San Bruno pipeline explosion. Uh, killed eight people, destroyed 38 homes. What happened here was that maintenance workers were working on the network and they cut electricity to the network while they were doing that. And what happened when they cut electricity to the network was that the pipeline was designed to fail open. The valves were supposed to fail open, which is what you want, right? You, cut, you lose electricity, you want customers to continue to receive gas to their homes. The problem is, is that this particular pipeline uh, had a flaw. It already had a crack in it from a backhoe uh, that had dug too deep into the dirt. And so the gas continues to, pu to pour into this pipeline. The pressure increases exactly like those centrifuges in Iran. 
and then eventually it explodes and it causes this. But what was happening is also that when they cut the electricity to the industrial control systems, the operators lost visual. Uh, lost visual um, uh, oversight of what actually was happening. They were looking at a static screen. They no longer realized that they weren't looking at a real-time screen, and they couldn't see that the pressure was increasing inside the pipeline. This occurred in 1999 in Bellingham, Washington, with the Olympic Pipeline Company. 237,000 gallons of gasoline poured, in, uh, poured into a waterway. Customers in the neighborhood were calling up the company, saying, we smell gasoline, we smell gas. The operators are looking at their monitors, they see nothing, no sign of a leak. Eventually it ignited, killed two 10-year-old boys in a park uh, and a teen. When investigators started looking at what happened here and looking at the networks, they discovered that the networks weren't segmented properly. Um, they did have a bridge uh, between them that wasn't fully secured. Hackers could have come in through the business network, moved their way to the process network. There's no sign that that's what happened, but back in 1999, we really weren't looking for that. Um, the other thing was that, that the control system and the safety system, which should have kicked in automatically, even if the operators didn't know what was going on, the safety system should have kicked in, and it didn't. The operators looked at their, at their, their monitoring stations. They didn't see any change. If the safety system saw it change, it certainly didn't kick in and shut down that pipeline and divert the gas. So who knows really what happened there? I don't think we have a really thorough investigation. This was just a fun thing. London Tower Bridge in 2021 uh, got stuck open over the waterway for about six to eight hours. Uh, they were referring to it as a software glitch. Remember that prison, prison cells opening, another software glitch. Um, required a team of engineers to investigate. They eventually replaced faulty relays. We never really got a, a clear answer about what happened. I decided to just do a little research to see if I could figure out what kind of control systems they're using. This was five minutes. Uh, got to the Rockwell automation uh, system, even uh, figured out where the PLC is. It's situated in the Northwest Pier machinery room. Uh, they're communicating via fiber optic cable, coax cables to a remote PLXX in the four piers. A lot of information in five minutes. Trains, I want to talk about those for a minute. Uh, you probably are familiar with this one going back to 2008. Uh, the train system in Lutz, Poland, was using infrared uh, to communicate uh, commands to the tracks in order to switch them. The train, uh, the 14-year-old decided to modify a TV remote and use the infrared to switch the tracks. Uh, he derailed four trams, uh, hurt some people. Um, this is the DC Metro crash in June 2009 in Washington, DC at commute hour. Killed nine people, injured 80. What happened in this case was that the sensors on the tracks failed. So there are sensors on the tracks that are supposed to indicate if there's a, tr if there's a train that has stopped at a station so that any incoming trains will know that and slow down or stop uh, before they get there. The sensors on this track at this station failed. An incoming train didn't realize that there was a train stopped in front of them. The operator uh, at the last minute was too late to engage the brake and it ran into the train in front of it. The interesting thing is that in 1999, uh, there were faulty relays found on the DC Metro that were sending incorrect instructions to trains. So they were telling one train to travel 45 miles per hour in a 15 mile per hour zone. So the potential to uh, create an intentional attack like this to uh, undermine those sensors uh, is there. This was a fatal derailment in Northeast Regional Train in 2015. Eight people dead, about 200 injured. What happened in this case was there was a train that was hit by a rock, and there was a lot of communication going on uh, with other operators, other trains, telling, asking them to look out for anyone along the tracks who might be throwing rocks, uh, a lot of just uh, radio communication going on, and the engineer was distracted. And when he got distracted, he was going around a bend and didn't slow down, and the train derailed. Now, a lot of the trains in, um, in that metro uh, family uh, use positive train control, which it takes the operator out of the equation, right? So it's automatic. It knows when it needs to slow down, when it's coming up to a bend. Um, but it, this train didn't, wasn't equipped with that. The thing is, is that when you start to automate that kind of activity and you take the operator out of the equation, you take the human out of the equation, you're also opening up another potential attack vector to undermine that automated system. There was a researcher who decided to look at that train system after this derailment and to see if it actually had vulnerabilities that someone could use to design an intentional attack. 
he discovered the things that we always discover in these kinds of cases, right? No authentication of commands, unencrypted communication, promiscuous system that will communicate with anything, vulnerabilities in the communication protocol, and also, by the way, a cabinet at the end of each business and coach class car that gives anyone on the train direct access to the electronics. Trains, of course, have a lot of potential attack vectors through the ticketing and gate systems, credit card processing systems, advertising signs, lighting systems, CCTV. Uh, in 2015, some researchers decided to put up a honey train, a honey pot. Uh, they put up a fake train network to see what kind of interest it would get and got 3 million probes and then some breaches as well over six weeks. Some of the hackers gained control uh, in about 10% of the cases. They kept coming back and coming back and dig digging, uh, probing deeper and deeper into that network. Um, okay, so. Uh, some of you are aware of this kind of activity. We are already seeing targeting of train systems uh, and also gas stations, of course, uh, attributed to Israel. Uh, wiper paralyzing systems, posting fake messages about cancellations, electronic display signs defaced with messages telling passengers to call the Ayatollah Khomeini's uh, office. Um, and in this case, with the gas stations, they disabled a government-issued smart card that are used for purchasing um, fuel that is subsidized by the government, so no one's cards were working. Uh, fuel became unavailable via the cards at more than 4,000 gas stations around the country. They could still get gas at a much higher price at some stations. Um, and again, they displayed this message um, with a phone number to call the Khomeini's office. And then they also digital signs over highways. So I want to go back uh, in the time that I have left uh, just to look at the weapon systems a bit. Um, because this is, I think, uh, a little about the future that hasn't really been explored much. This is a report from the Government Accountability Office in the US. Um, these kinds of reports are created. They dig deep. Uh, investigators can spend a couple of years doing these. They create these reports uh, for lawmakers at Congress. Um, and in this particular report, they focused on weapon systems. And their conclusion, the summary was that despite warnings, uh, security warnings, years and years of security warnings, the DOD hadn't been paying attention to prioritizing the security of weapon systems. So what they found here was uh, there were a lot of mission critical vulnerabilities that were being routinely found in systems that were under development. They had poor password management, default passwords that weren't getting changed, unencrypted communications. Testers were able to seize control of weapon systems undetected. In one case, a two-person team uh, took just one hour for initial access and then uh, just a day for full control. Uh, in one case, they were uh, able to cause parts of a system to shut down simply by scanning the system. And as a joke, they had an alert pop up in one case saying, please insert some quarters to continue operating. Um, so the weapon systems, uh, many of them, uh, you would think they're not connected to the internet, but they do have communication. Uh, they have a lot of potential avenues for attack. Um, they are, have radio communications receivers, radar receivers, USB ports for potentially insider attacks. Um, this is, of course, fake weapon, again, for illust illustrative purposes. Um, So this is 2021. The NSA is getting so concerned that DOD hasn't taken this very seriously um, and is basically telling them to lock down your weapon systems before the hackers get to them. Uh, in terms of weapon systems, we have computers on wings at sea and on land. None of them work without computers. This is Rob Joyce, head of the NSA directorate. So you've got computers controlling firing, precision aiming, uh, GPS navigation, and communications voice and data all potentially attack vectors. This is something that I put in the book. This is just like a footnote in the book. Um, this occurred in South Africa in 2007. This is a German Swiss, we Swiss, German Swiss weapon. Um, they were testing the weapon, and of course it's shooting, and then all of a sudden it spins around and it starts shooting the soldiers that are standing behind the weapon. Nine soldiers killed, 14 injured. Uh, initially they were saying that it was a software glitch. There's that word again, software glitch. Uh, with some little investigation, what they came out with was a report that it wasn't a, a digital issue, it was a mechanical issue, a spring pin just the size of a matchstick uh, was responsible for switching the system from uh, mechanical to, uh, from manual to electronic, got sheared off, um, and that triggered the system to just start firing. And then there are supposed to be these protectors that prevent the gun from moving uh, beyond a certain limit, 
And somehow it just basically broke through those barriers and switched or flipped around and started shooting the soldiers behind it. Again, do we trust the reports? I don't know. Um, there's not a lot of transparency here. Um, we know that the manufacturer fought back and said that it wasn't any kind of software glitch. Um, but anyways, mechanical failures. This is 2014. This was reported by the New York Times. They said that Obama had ordered digital sabotage of North Korean missiles. Um, what we saw was that were, there were a lot, of, a lot of testing of North Korean missiles going on. Some of them were successful, but a lot of them were exploding upon launch, uh, veering off course, disintegrating in midair, or plunging into the sea. Um, the New York Times reports that it's unclear which of these are sabotage, but it was a case of what they're calling left of launch, where you're getting into the development phase of the weapons and altering the software, the code, in some way that sabotages them when they're ultimately launched. We don't have a lot of details on that, though, just that initial reporting. And I want to, sort of want to end on this because uh, Ukraine is so prominent in the news right now. Ukraine has been using and receiving a lot of weapons uh, from uh, allies. Uh, a lot of the weapons that Ukraine uh, owned are sort of old generation weapons uh, that don't have a lot of digital controls and that don't have a lot of computer controls. But they are going to be getting next generation systems uh, from the US and elsewhere with the HIMARS, which do have a lot of computer control in them. And so in essentially providing the Ukrainians with a lot of uh, military capability, you're also potentially creating uh, new kinds of vulnerabilities. I was speaking with uh, Dmitry Alperovich. I don't know if you guys know, the, know him from CrowdStrike. Um, now he's no longer CrowdStrike, but he does consulting with governments and everything. And he said that he didn't think that the Russians had the capability to be sabotaging this equipment right away, that it would probably take them a year or more to figure out vulnerabilities and design attacks against them. And of course, they're preoccupied with a lot of other things at this point. But that's assuming that they weren't already interested in these systems before they were uh, being given to Ukraine. So it's unclear at this point um, what kinds of attacks uh, can be targeted against these kinds of systems. It's unclear what the vulnerabilities are. Again, there's not a lot of uh, research going on in this area, not a lot of transparency, um, but I'll just leave you with that. So thank you for your time.